I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the PRS Journal Club podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sammy Sino, Amanda Silva, and Raj Shah Martinez. Enjoy. Hello, and welcome to the October 2016 edition of the PRS Journal Club. My name is Raj Shah Martinez, and I'm joined by my fellow resident ambassadors, Amanda Silva and Sammy Sino. This month, we are joined by Dr. Devinder Singh, Director of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery at the Anne Arundel Medical Center in Annapolis, Maryland. Dr. Singh graduated medical school from Columbia University and trained at Yale Plastic Surgery and was on faculty at the University of Maryland Division of Plastic Surgery. He's active in the State Medical Society and a staunch supporter and mentor of residents around the country. Welcome, Dr. Singh. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, in this discussion, we'll be focusing in on a review article by Drs. Brett Phillips and Eric Halverson, evaluating the evidence behind antibiotic prophylaxis following implant-based breast reconstruction. In this review of the literature, the authors queried PubMed and Cochrane databases to select retrospective and prospective studies that reported on antibiotic regimens associated with infection rates in implant-based reconstruction. The authors found seven studies that met their inclusion criteria, five clinical studies, and two reviews, published between 1995 and 2014. The authors uh, do a great job and they dissect each of these studies and their limitations, finding complexity in the reporting of the antibiotic duration, categorization of infection, and use of adjuncts such as acellular germline matrices. From their review, several themes did emerge. The studies that have evaluated implant-based reconstruction infections and prolonged prophylactic antibiotic use were broken down into the antibiotic administration of less than 24 hours or greater than 24 hours with these layer study regimens having antibiotics being used until uh, drains were removed, while others seem to have the same cutoffs at around five or seven days. The end result of all this data and analysis is somewhat mixed, with a general trend towards the use of perioperative antibiotics for 24 hours as improved over no antibiotics, but not really having a statistically significant difference that was seen throughout all the studies over prolonged antibiotic use, although this, there was some variance in some of the strength of the data. Long-term antibiotics were found to have later infections, with more often, which more often resulted in expander loss and potentially increased likelihood to grow resistant organisms. The study cited in this review provided us with a range of rates of infection complications, some as low as 2 to 5 percent and some as high as 20 to 30 percent, with variance depending on the clinical situation and no clear, clear, clearly statistically defined difference or trend among the studies. The others do an excellent job of parsing the details in each of these, and their limitations, and ultimately conclude that we're really unable to have a definitive answer and advocate for a standard definition of infection and the standardization of our reporting with future clinical trials. They do note that they're in, in their conclusion, however, that level one evidence suggests that 24 hours of perioperative antibiotics is not inferior to prolonged antibiotic use, and they recommend limiting postoperative antibiotics in implant-based reconstruction to 24 hours. They also importantly suggest that a patient-centered antibiotic prophylaxis regimen should be based on a risk assessment model to determine which, if any patients, may benefit from prolonged antibiotic prophylaxis. Now, this is a fairly controversial topic, and I think we'd open up to the group. What do you guys do in your different programs? And, and Dr. Singh, what is your opinion? Do you leave uh, antibiotics until the drains come out? So, you know, I really applaud uh, Halverson and uh, Phillips for trying to tackle such a common uh, scenario that we all encounter, which is antibiotic prophylaxis after implant-based reconstruction, whether it be an expander or an implant. And the, it is a common problem, and we just don't have a good answer. And just like you mentioned, Raj, people use different parameters to, to make their decision. For example, this question of drains. Is it until the drain comes out? Is it seven days, which is just an arbitrary number, or is it 24 hours, or is it just one preoperative dose? So uh, in my practice, I do, and it, this is totally arbitrary, five days of um, antibiotics, even if a drain remains, which is usually the case. On the other hand, in my own practice, my partner uses um, antibiotics until the, the drain is removed. So even in one group of two plastic surgeons, we have – um, we have differing opinions. So for, for that, I really applaud the authors in trying to narrow down what the, what the proper answer should be. Unfortunately, um, 
the data that we have available to us, which they have reviewed in this paper, isn't really that great. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think one of the other things I personally would have may have liked to see, and they have their great, their, their two tables are actually really good because they really go through the studies in detail and they really parse it down to the level of evidence and what their conclusions are. But I think describing a power analysis of these studies would have been a little bit useful as well to know, well, were these adequately powered in their sample size to be able to detect a true difference between even the parameters that they're using? Some studies that have, you know, hundreds and, or, you know, almost, you know, up to 2,000 patients in some of them, but some of them had far fewer numbers, and I think that also becomes a bit of a problem. What, what do you guys think yeah, about I, in New York? Oh, sorry. I, just like Dr. Singh was saying, there's some people here that will do it till the dreams come out, and in the very same practice, others that arbitrarily keep it for five or seven days or three days. So it's, um, you know, it's just going to be something that's really tough to – Establish with level one evidence, although it's been attempted, as you can see from some of the studies that they reviewed. But with so many factors and patient specific factors, uh, I think it's going to be something that's going to take some time and a really well designed, large subset of patient study that really have a clear answer of what's best. <laughs> you know, I, yeah, one, you... one of the thoughts, sorry, go ahead, Amanda. Yeah, that's exactly right. For example, I use Duracef, uh, and um, my partner sometimes uses clindamycin. So you're exactly right mm -hmm. that um, it, it's just kind of arbitrary. And that's the problem. When there's so many arbitrarily made decisions, it lends itself towards not being evidence-based. And to that point, I think what we really need next is probably um, – either what the authors recommended, which is a really well-done, randomized, controlled, prospective trial, or a meta-analysis. And, and that's one of the things that I find a little bit disappointing about this article, which is um, they have taken multiple previously um, published bodies of work, including two systematic reviews and a couple of other retrospective reviews, seven papers in total, and then they just did another systematic review on top of that, where, where really the next step should have been uh, a meta-analysis, and meta-analysis really is a technique that allows you to overcome the problem of small sample size, assuming that the papers that you're including in your meta-analysis have the same or similar enough methodology that you can combine the data sets and that they mm -hmm. looked for or measured similar outcomes, say, for example, surgical site infection. And um, meta-analysis, when done properly, allows you to adjust for something called heterogeneity, which in these papers mm -hmm. is called um, – that, that, that is called I squared, if you look for it in the papers. And the I squared or the heterogeneity of the included paper should be low, um, and that helps you judge whether this meta-analysis is good or bad, so on and so forth. So I, I think the next step outside of a randomized controlled trial, which we all know is very hard to do and to do well, and I, I might add to repeat and find the same findings – um, before we get to that, which we need to, maybe a meta-analysis would be the next best step for um, somebody listening to this podcast or, or, or a resident who's interested in trying to help figure out the answer. Well, it's interesting because I think they kind of briefly mentioned um, that they considered that, but that they thought maybe there was too much heterogeneity between the studies, or they mentioned that, you know, a, a key point going forward is that we – um, have a more standardized approach to how we report these uh, complications and outcomes. And I think maybe it's only briefly mentioned, but I kind of got gathered from reading that they considered it, but they just thought that the studies weren't conducive to doing a meta-analysis. Yeah, that's totally true. You're right. They acknowledge that, and, and it is a problem in surgical science in general. Um, there's just too much variability in nomenclature. We just don't use the same words 
um, between different specialties or between different um, between different papers, and then that that causes major problems in how we can aggregate the data or combine the data and then analyze them analyze them later. You're right. Yeah, that's that's, a, that's an excellent point, guys, and I, I totally agree with both of those. And the only one other thing, and maybe in wrapping up our discussion, that I would mention, they, they did also look sort of separately uh, in their discussion. They mentioned looking at autologous reconstruction, which is sort of a totally different ball game. And there they say mm-hmm. there is there are good studies that have shown that uh, only perioperative less than 24 hours of antibiotics is appropriate, and those uh, autologous breast reconstruction should not have prolonged antibiotics. Just sort of as an aside, to, to really make the point that in our implant-based reconstruction, we have a foreign body, we have drains, and potentially the use of acellular matrices with hypothetically comprised, uh, sorry, compromised uh, blood flow to very thin flaps. So. You know, one of the things for people listening who may be in other surgical fields where the viewer sort of often as plastic surgeons critiqued for the prolonged use of antibiotics, you know, this is somewhat of a separate um, grouping or, or type of procedure where it's not necessarily just removing something and putting it in and the blood supply is all totally fine. We're really challenging the the area to really heal with a lot of foreign bodies and pressure and tension that you know, I think that's what makes people a bit wary and nervous and why we sort of end up having prolonged antibiotics for, for different reasons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. All- alloplastic breast reconstruction or, or implant-based breast, breast reconstruction is highly complicated. As you said, up to 30% of them can become infected. And the trouble with that is it can often require the expander or implant to be removed and a resulting open wound. And then, of course, as, as we all know, that can, in some cases, delay the initiation of required adjuvant therapy, and there's really no price on that. I mean, that's just a devastating complication. Um, if, we're, if we're delaying life-saving treatment, it's a, it's a big problem. And actually, I think it's one that we don't really acknowledge enough or talk about or report enough as plastic surgeons, whether or not we're using autologous or alloplastic styles of reconstruction. I mean, for example, if you do a a giant free flap and you have an abdominal donor site complication and the oncologist doesn't want to start chemotherapy, it's a, it's a bad problem and we don't talk about it enough. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, that's a great point. Thank you guys so much for an excellent discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.